Welcome to the second module on internal curing for concrete. In this module, we'll discuss the concept of internal curing, we'll discuss how mixtures are proportioned for internal curing, and we'll discuss the properties of the aggregates that are used in internal curing. But before we begin, let's discuss the objectives in detail on what we would like to cover in this module. First, we're going to try to understand what's meant by the term internal curing. We're going to understand how internal curing is similar to conventional curing and some of the aspects that make it a little bit different. Second, we're going to understand the principles that are used to proportion internally cured concrete mixtures. Specifically, we're going to determine how much lightweight aggregate would be added to the concrete mixture. Second, we're going to talk about the importance of how the aggregates are spaced throughout the mixture. And finally, we're going to talk about the properties of the aggregate that are going to be useful when it comes to making the concrete internally cured. Finally, we're going to discuss some of the tests that are needed to quantify the aggregate performance and to use in quality control practices. So with that information at hand, let's begin and discuss really what we mean by the term curing. And this could be conventional curing. And really what we're talking about here is a process by which hydraulic cement concretes mature, develop strength, harden, and react over time. The idea here is that to properly cure concrete, we need to continue the hydration reaction. And this requires that our cement or our cementitious material is in the presence of sufficient amount of water and a sufficient temperature or a sufficient heat. So the goals to have successful curing are to make sure that we have water present and that we have a sufficient temperature or heat for this reaction to take place and this reaction to progress and this reaction to move forward. So when we talk about curing, Water is going, to play in it, is going to play a vital role in the reaction process. Now for conventional curing, ACI 308 defines curing as measures taken to limit the loss of water or heat or both from concrete or by externally providing moisture and heat. They also go on to say that that they also go on to say that curing is any action that's taken to maintain moisture and temperature conditions in a freshly placed concrete to allow hydraulic cement hydration reactions and pozzolanic reactions to occur. So really what we're talking about here is nothing different than we talked about on the previous slide. We want to maintain moisture in the system, we want to maintain heat in the system, and we're talking about actions that are taken to, to keep that uh, in our concrete so that we can have the hydraulic reaction undergoing, we can have the pozzolanic reaction undergoing, and our concrete can develop strength and mature. Now external concrete, as was said in the previous definition, is really done on the outside of the concrete. So if we think about this, we can think about our friend the lobster here, where the lobster has its skeleton on the outside. This is really what we're doing with our curing. We're doing uh, things to the outside of the concrete after the concrete's placed, to help promote this hydration reaction. So if we look at this little picture in the top corner, one of the most common things that we'll do is we'll supply additional water, we'll pond water on our concrete, that water will then penetrate the concrete and will provide this additional moisture to help in the reaction. So this is what we talk about when we think about conventional curing practices, something that's done on the outside of our concrete, much like the exoskeleton of our lobster here. Some of the other types of external curing that are going to be done, uh, when we look at this, we can really look at the addition of additional water through water ponding, or we can look at a curing membrane. Now, there's a very big difference between these two types of curing. One is actively supplying additional water through water ponding, sprinkling, burlap. They're going to supply additional water that's going to go into the concrete and that's going to help in the reaction. However, when we talk about curing membranes or we talk about placing a, a visqueen sheet or something like that on the surface, what we're really talking about here is reducing the loss of water that's already inside of the concrete and we're really talking about trying to minimize the evaporation losses out of our concrete. So there's a little bit of a subtle difference between the two. Both are external, both are done on the outside of our concrete, we can be adding water such as the case of water ponding or sprinkling or burlap, but if we're using something like a curing membrane, we're really reducing the loss of water to the outside, but we're not really adding water to the system. 
So the question becomes, are there other ways that we could look at putting water into our concrete to increase the hydration reaction that's going on? And if we think about this, to go back to our skeleton analogy where we had the lobster with the external skeleton or the exoskeleton, uh, we know that there's also animals that exist. Here we can see an example of the dinosaur or humans where there's a inside skeleton. We're going to talk about curing concrete from the inside out with internal curing and that's really going to provide water in a little bit of a different way. The important part of this though is the goal of the curing is the same. It's to make sure that we're supplying sufficient moisture so that the reaction can take place. So the concept of curing we're doing exactly what we know from Concrete 101 to be exactly what is good for the concrete. We're making sure to supply moisture that helps to hydrate the cement, promote the hydraulic reaction, promote the pozzolanic reaction. But we're going to go about this in a slightly different way. So internal curing works from the inside out. It uses reservoirs of water that are going to be hidden inside of the concrete. They're going to be hidden inside of the concrete and they're going to release water at exactly the right time to help hydrate the overall cement. So if we look at our picture here, at the top we can have aggregates inside of our concrete. If we use external ponding like a conventional curing, that is going to, we're going to have some penetration of water from the surface. Now as our concrete gets more and more dense, this penetration of water is going to become more and more difficult and it's going to have a limited depth. The concept behind internal curing is to replace a portion of the aggregates with these green and white um, aggregates that are going to be porous inclusions, lightweight aggregates. Those lightweight aggregates are going to be able to give up their water and affect a certain region around the aggregate, generally on the order of two to three millimeters, where water is going to be able to flow and get curing water to that portion of the paste. Now, in a properly internally cured uh, concrete, what you're going to see is these aqua regions that control where the water is getting to around those aggregates. Those aqua regions are going to start to overlap because we've placed enough aggregate into the system that we have the aggregates within sufficient distance that we can effectively cure the whole concrete. So the whole idea behind internal curing is to use porous reservoirs. We're going to have water in those reservoirs. We're going to hide that water before set. And this is important because we're going to have a low porosity in our concrete. We're going to have a nice dense microstructure. And before setting, we want to lock in that real low porosity. However, after setting, these lightweight inclusions, these porous inclusions, are going to provide water that's going to continue the hydration process as the water is going to be drawn out of the lightweight aggregate. So to get into a little more details, where is it exactly that we're hiding the, the internal curing water? We're hiding it in a porous body. So here what we can see is a porous body. This is sort of a cutaway of a lightweight aggregate. The lightweight aggregate can be pre-wetted such that the pores or the holes inside of the aggregate will absorb water and that water can be released back to the concrete after setting. The water that's hidden inside of the lightweight aggregate doesn't count towards your water to cement ratio, doesn't count to your initial porosity of concrete. It's hidden inside of the lightweight aggregate and this is really one of the reasons why this trick works very very well. Now you may be saying well concrete's been around for thousands of years why internal cure concrete and why is it important now that we start looking into this? And as we've mentioned a little bit, higher performance concretes are becoming more dense. We're using more low water to cement ratio materials, we're using more supplemental materials, and we're using lower water to cement ratios in our concrete. And really the goal of the high performance concrete is to minimize porosity, disconnect the large pores, and make it harder for fluids to be transported through our concrete. Well, as we make it harder for seawater and other uh, fluids to be transported through our concrete, it also becomes harder for curing water to become transported for our, through our concrete. So the idea here is in higher performance concretes, we can really distribute these pockets or reservoirs of water throughout the cross section of our concrete. Second, while these high performance concretes are good for durability, right? They're going to make it hard for the water to move in, as we were just discussing, but they can also make our concrete a little bit more prone to cracking. So one of the reasons for this is something called self-desiccation. And we can think of this as the concrete sort of drying out, but without the loss of water to the outside. The self-desiccation is going to increase 
as you go to lower and lower water to cement ratios and as you start adding supplemental materials. This is driven by the hydration reaction and it's really driven by the pore size distribution. So as we're moving to higher performance concretes, as we're using more supplemental materials, as we're using materials that react more quickly, this is really what's starting to bring internal curing right into the uh, right into the picture because these are the types of concretes that internal curing really works best for. Now we've introduced some new terminology and we're going to be trying to describe this terminology as we go through. The term self-desiccation was introduced and this is really can be thought of like a drying that takes place but without the loss of water to the outside of the concrete. This is a drying that takes place because of a chemical reaction that's called chemical shrinkage and vapor filled space is going to form inside of our concrete. Now this vapor filled space is important because it's going to lead to a reduction in the relative humidity of our concrete. It's going to start emptying out the pores and the real challenge here is when we do this we're really going to increase the shrinkage of our concrete and we have the potential to really slow down the reaction or even cease the hydration reaction. So there are a couple things that we really want to get into and we'll go through these as we go through the module but one of the things we want to pay specific attention to is what's causing these pores to empty and really the cause is chemical shrinkage and we'll describe this in greater detail as we go further and then the second thing is is the size of the pores really important and what we're going to argue is that this is important because this chemical shrinkage happens in all concretes but this problem of self desiccation only really starts to become an issue when we get to lower and lower water to cement ratio concretes. So what we really want to try to do as we go through uh, the remaining portion of the module here is we really want to talk about some of the proportioning principles that are important for internal curing. First, we're going to talk about this, this spacing of the aggregate. As we mentioned earlier, it's really important that the water can flow out of the lightweight aggregate and can cover a certain amount of the paste. The distance that that water can flow is really relatively small, so we want to have our aggregates so that each one is responsible for controlling an area of a few millimeters right around the surface of the aggregate. Typically, we're going to try to limit this to about two millimeters. This is going to lead us to wanting to use a lot of lightweight fine aggregate or lightweight sands. The second part is what we're going to spend most of our time on, and this is determining how much lightweight aggregate or how much internal curing water we need and this is going to be based on a simple calculation that says we want to be able to fill in all the vapor filled spaces that form when the hydration reaction occurs. The final thing that will be important when we start to talk about the, the proportioning principles is really what properties of the aggregate really drive this proportioning and obviously how much water the aggregate can hold but how the aggregate gives back that water are going to be two of the most important properties that we're going to look at. So why don't we begin with a little bit of a discussion on the aggregate spacing and remember the whole reason why we're interested in the aggregate spacing is because we want water to be able to reach all of the paste that's inside of our concrete. Now in this slide what we're going to do is we're going to show you a picture that starts to describe how close um, the paste is to the surface of the aggregate with a couple different scenarios. This is based on some work out of NIST where they've used this model and in this model what we can see are there are going to be several different colors being represented. In the top image what we have are the red being our typical aggregates, the yellow being our porous lightweight aggregates, and we have the white and blue representing different regions of the paste. White is a region that's more than two millimeters away from the surface of a lightweight aggregate. The blue regions, dark blue, is very close to the surface of an aggregate within half a millimeter or 0.1 millimeters. Uh, and on the, as we move our way toward aqua, we get to a region that's within about two millimeters of the surface of the aggregate. Now the interesting part about these two pictures are if we look at the top image and we look at the bottom image, we have exactly the same volume of lightweight aggregate in both of those images. But the difference is on the top, we're looking at replacing larger aggregate, let's say the coarse aggregate, where on the bottom we're replacing some of the fine aggregate or the smaller aggregate. And the whole idea that we're trying to depict here, the whole thing that we're trying to show, is when you use smaller aggregate, you'll have more of the paste 
uh, accessible in that two millimeter region around the aggregate to get some of this additional curing water. When we use the coarse aggregate, this also works for internal curing. However, the distance that the fluid can travel is much more limited. And what you'll notice at the top is we have a large portion of the paste that just doesn't get that internal curing water. So this really tells us that technologically there's a big advantage of replacing the sand with a fine lightweight aggregate sand. And this is because it's going to help with the aggregate particle spacing. So we're going to be able to space the aggregates in such a way that we can get internal curing water throughout the matrix. There's additional benefits that we'll see in, by using our, our normal coarse aggregate where we'll see uh, very similar strengths and other aspects here. But the real reason that we're after using fine lightweight aggregates to do our internal curing is to make sure that we get a good dis dis distribution of the aggregates. Now one of the things that we've done is we've done several calculations and by looking at standard ASTM C33 gradations, we can say that under the normal circumstances, we generally have very good distribution when we're replacing the sand and have over 85% of the paste covered. So provided we're using conventional uh, lightweight aggregate sands, we're doing very well by using those sands and covering a large portion of the matrix. And therefore, we're going to focus in on some other aspects as we look at our proportioning. Specifically, we're going to focus in on how much lightweight aggregate or how much in cure, internal curing water is needed for the internal curing of concrete. And really what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to focus our calculations in on trying to simply replace the vapor-filled space that's created by chemical shrinkage. And we're going to try to find out how much water is required to fill in that vapor-filled space and put in the amount of lightweight aggregate to do that. There are other ways that we could proportion these mixtures. We could start to also account for evaporation or other things like that. But in this mod module, we're going to focus in specifically on simply trying to replace the chemical shrinkage water. Now, what is chemical shrinkage? This may be another new term, so we want to take a second and we want to start to describe this. Chemical shrinkage has been, has been observed for cements for a long period of time. Le Chatelier saw this, and the basic idea behind this is, is actually quite simple. Le Chatelier said that the volume of the reactants is larger than the volume of the reacted products. So what was he really trying to say here? Well, if I have one volume of cement and one volume of water, and I react those together, I don't get two total volumes when everything's done. I get a smaller volume of the reacted products. So by taking one volume of cement plus one volume of water, I end up getting something like 1.8 volumes of reacted product plus this extra green area that's shown as chemical shrinkage. Now, if we look at our graph on the top, what we can see is as we hydrate the system, we're going to react cement, we're going to react capillary water, and we're going to form hydration products that are shown in red. That's our hydration solid and our hydration gel. But we're also going to see a shrinkage, the shrinkage in the system, that's going to be linear with the degree of hydration. Now, the important part of this is this chemical shrinkage is actually going to lead to the self-desiccation that we were talking about earlier. But the timing on this becomes very important. At very early ages, before our concrete sets, we can look at this image and we can say, well, we start out, we place cement into water, that cement is going to start to react, we're going to see a volume change, but we're going to notice that the external volume change shown here in red is going to be equivalent to the chemical shrinkage that's shown as the red line on our graphs here. As we go further and further through the hydration process, this is going to continue and we're going to see both of these shrinking. And as long as the system can keep collapsing on itself, the external shrinkage is going to be equal to the chemical shrinkage. However, we're going to reach a certain point in time where all of a sudden the system is going to stiffen up and it's not going to be able to collapse on itself. The chemical shrinkage is going to keep going, but the external volume change just won't be able to accommodate that. And what we're going to notice is that these vapor-filled spaces start to form that are shown here in yellow. Those vapor-filled spaces are going to be the difference between this chemical shrinkage line shown in red and the autogenous shrinkage or the external shrinkage shown here in blue. These vapor-filled spaces 
are representative of this concept of self-desiccation. The concept that our concrete is sort of getting vapor-filled spaces like it's drying, but we really haven't lost moisture. We're just opening up spaces inside of the, inside of the microstructure. So we can measure this chemical shrinkage as a function of time. And here we can see the chemical shrinkage as a red line. And this area under that curve is really the difference between the chemical shrinkage that's occurring in red and the autogenous shrinkage that we see here in blue. And what we can determine is we're emptying out pores inside of the microstructure and replacing those with sort of a vapor-filled space. So if we look at our little graph at the bottom here, our little... Um, our little illustrated uh, graph at the bottom, what we'll notice is that we have different size pores. We have big pores working our way over to small pores. And the one thing that we need to recognize is the big pores are going to be the pores that empty out first. And the volume that is emptied in this big pore is going to be equal to our chemical shrinkage. So the more our system hydrates, the more vapor-filled space we're going to have inside of, this, inside of our cement base. Now it's important to note that this occurs in all cements and this occurs as the hydration reaction is taking place. The amount of chemical shrinkage will actually increase when we start using supplementary materials. So for things like a pozzolanic reaction, the chemical shrinkage will be higher even than it is for the hydraulic reaction that we see in many of these systems. Now, why is this such an issue in lower water to cement ratio concretes if this happens all the time when cement hydrates? Well, what I want to mention here is the chemical shrinkage that occurs is really just related to the water and the cement reacting, and it's not very sensitive to the water to cement ratio, right? But what is really important and why the water to cement ratio becomes important is because when we talk about self-desiccation, it's really the size of the voids that are emptying that become very important. If we have a high water to cement ratio concrete, we empty out big bores, and when we empty out larger and larger pores, the stress that develops when R is a big value, when the meniscus size, when the pore that's emptying out is a big value, we end up with a relatively low stress. However, as we move to lower water to cement ratio systems, or systems where we've got finely defined powders, like a silica fume or things like that, this R value is going to become smaller and smaller, and all of a sudden, those emptied out pores become a bigger and bigger deal because they're generating more stress inside the system. They're generating more stress inside of the fluid, making it harder for that fluid to react, making us have more shrinkage in the overall system. So while shrink chemical shrinkage occurs in all concrete, while self-desiccation occurs in all concrete, it's really the low water to cement ratios where this becomes important because we're emptying out smaller and smaller pores and generating larger and larger capillary stresses in those systems. So let's take a break and let's take a, a second here to summarize what we understand so far. Curing is providing or maintaining water that's going to help the cement hydrate. Whether we do this internally or externally, we're providing additional water to help the hydration process. While most curing is done externally, here the idea with internal curing is we're going to hide water inside the porous lightweight aggregates. Internal curing is more important when we talk about low water to cement ratio mixtures and mixtures with supplementary cements because we have a finer pore structure and we can have more chemical shrinkage taking place when we're using supplementary materials. Finally, self-desiccation is going to be really the driver, and this is driven when vapor-filled spaces are forming because of the hydration reaction. This is emptying out the pores, and this is causing us to have um, higher amounts of shrinkage, lower amounts of cement reaction, specifically in lower water to cement ratio concretes where we're emptying out smaller and smaller pores and putting the fluid under higher amounts of tension. So now that we've taken a moment to summarize some of those main concepts, what we really want to get back to is how do we determine the mixture proportions for an internally cured concrete? Now I want to mention here that the concept of mixture proportioning these internally cured mixtures is very simple. What we're going to focus in on here is really providing a volume of water that's equivalent to the volume of chemical shrinkage that's occurring inside of the mixture. 
As I mentioned before, there are other ways that you could determine how much lightweight aggregate and how much internal curing water that you would need. If you want to do some sort of a calculation for external drying or some other event that's going on. However, for the examples that I'm going to show here, we're going to put in a volume of internal curing water that's equal to the volume of chemical shrinkage. Said another way, we could think of this as simple supply and demand. On the demand side, here shown in the blue pores, what we have is a volume shown here in green that's being created by chemical shrinkage. This is the volume of the vapor filled space. We want to calculate that volume and we want to set that equal to the volume of water that could be stored inside of the lightweight aggregate. So the concept behind this is actually very simple. How much space is being created by chemical shrinkage? and then how much water do we need to fill in that space and how much aggregate is going to be needed to hold that water. Very simple straightforward concept and we'll go through some calculations that will allow us to do this. Now there's three basic ways that we could look at this and we'll start off with the simpler approaches um, and work our way up to more complicated aspects here. The first simple approach here is really let's put seven pounds of water for every hundred pounds of cementitious materials that we have inside of our mixture. They may say this sounds really unscientific compared to everything else that we have, but let's take a second to think about what we're trying to do. We're trying to replace the volume, um, we're trying to place a volume of water that fills up the empty volume that was created by the chemical shrinkage. So when we hydrate 100 pounds of cement, the chemical shrinkage is going to result in a volume that's filled up with about 7 pounds of water. This is a simple rule of thumb that can be used. However, this could be very beneficial to get a good rough estimate for how we internally cure our concrete mixtures. So if we start out, we can start to put some numbers behind this. If we say we've got 7 pounds of water for every 100 pounds of cement in our mix, and we've got a 6-bag mix, 7 pounds times 6 bags, a uh, 6 bag mix, which would be 564 pounds of cement inside of our mixture. 7 times 564 divided by our 100 pounds of cement would say that we need 39.5 pounds per cubic yard of internal curing water. Now, if we had an aggregate that has a 15% absorption, 39.5 pounds divided by 15% would give us an oven dry mass of our lightweight aggregate of about 263 pounds. This is a very good first approximation for determining how much aggregate we need to have in the system, how much internal curing water we need to have in the system. We can then start to use this uh, in our conventional concrete. We can take our conventional concrete mixture. We know on the previous, uh, the previous slide how much lightweight aggregate we want to add in. We can take our masses for our conventional concrete. We can look at the densities for all of the individual constituents and determine the volume fractions that those individual constituents would have. We then would want to go and we'd want to figure out how much volume would be occupied by this 263 pounds of oven dry aggregate plus 39 pounds of internal curing water. So we can take the 263 pounds of aggregate, divide by the specific gravity of the oven dry aggregate times uh, the unit weight of water and we can find out that the volume of lightweight aggregate is 2.78 cubic feet. So what we're doing here is we're saying we're going to take out 2.78 feet of sand and replace it with 2.78 feet of lightweight fine sand. So in our conventional mixture, we had 9.05 cubic feet of sand. We want to take out 2.78 cubic feet, which represents the volume of the lightweight aggregate, which would mean we'd have 6.28 cubic feet of sand left in our mixture. That would mean that if we go through the entire uh, calculation, the mass of the sand in the internally cured mixture would be 1,051 pounds. So to compare and contrast our mixtures, we have the conventional concrete shown in the center column. We have the internally cured concrete shown on the far right. What you'll notice in the internally cured mixture is the cement content has not changed in the mixture. The water content has not changed in the mixture. The coarse aggregate content has not changed in the mixture. What we've noticed here is a difference in the fine aggregate 
the fine aggregate here is saying that we're going to take out a portion of the sand. We're going to go from 1,515 pounds to 1,051 pounds, and we're going to place a lightweight aggregate inside of the system to make up the difference in volume. Again, to drive this point home, we're taking all of those proportions and we're simply placing those proportions here on a graph that shows the volumetric contribution to the overall concrete. The cement being shown on the bottom, identical between those mixtures, water identical, coarse aggregates, air, all occupying the exact same volume. The only difference here is we're going to take about 10% of the sand volume and replace it with lightweight aggregate when we go to the internally cured concrete mixture. So this is a very simple approach and this is a very simple way to think about our internally cured concretes. Now we've done the rule of thumb, the simple rule of thumb method. We could also do this with a simple straightforward calculation and the calculation is going to do exactly what we were talking about. It's going to relate the supply and the demand that we were talking about. The demand being the volume of chemical shrinkage, the supply being the volume of water that we're hiding inside of the lightweight aggregate. So if we can do this, we can now start to write equations to do this. And the whole idea here is we're going to start off working on each side of the equation where we're setting the, submit, the supply equal to the demand. Now the demand again is the volume of chemical shrinkage and we can determine that using three factors. The cement factor, how much cementitious material is in our concrete, and to simplify this at least for right now, we will simply frequently assume that the total cementitious content is just the sum of our Portland cement and any supplementary materials that we would have inside of the mixture. CS is the chemical shrinkage, where we can make an estimate that this is about 0 0.064 milliliters per gram, an alpha max would be the degree of hydration, which for many, many systems would be a value of 1. However, if we get below a water to cement ratio of 0.36, this alpha max term will be a number that's slightly less than 1 because we simply just can't react all the cement that's inside of the mixture. So the basic idea here is to know the demand portion of this equation. We are trying to calculate the volume of chemical shrinkage that occurs inside of the system. To do that we need to know the amount of cement, we need to know how much chemical shrinkage that cement will exhibit, and we need to know how much hydration will take place. And we've given some simple rules of thumb on how we would calculate those numbers. Now for the supply side of the equation, what we need to know is the mass of the lightweight aggregate the porosity or the absorption of that lightweight aggregate and then frequently a saturation factor is thrown into this equation if we're going to start to having values that are different from the absorption value for our particular concrete. If we don't have a value that's different from our absorption uh, of our concrete and in designing the mixture we frequently don't, we simply set the S value equal to 1 and our supply is the mass of the lightweight aggregate times the absorption or the porosity that would be filled with water when our material is pre-wetted. So simply, supply is what's being provided by the lightweight aggregate, demand is what the cement paste needs. Now we can go through an example of this and we can determine the mass of lightweight aggregate for a cubic yard of concrete if we're using internal curing. Again, we might have our plain mixture with a cement content of 560 pounds per cubic yard chemical shrinkage of 0 0.07 milliliters per gram of cement, lightweight aggregate with about 15% porosity, and we'll assume alpha max equals 1 and S equals a value of 1 as we go through these calculations. So the mass of the lightweight aggregate is going to be determined simply by the cement factor times the chemical shrinkage times alpha divided by the porosity times our S value and what we would determine here is a value of 262 pounds per cubic yard which would be very similar to what we saw in our simple rule of thumb type of approach on our previous slides. There's an alternative way that you could do this. A nomograph was developed by folks at NIST. This is a picture of the equations that we have just mentioned. We would enter this with 560 pounds per cubic yard of our cement. We go up to the chemical shrinkage line shown here in green, which is a value of 0.07, um, which is what we saw in our example. 
We determine the water demand, which would be about 40 pounds per cubic yard. Um, once we have that, we can come down here to our 15% absorption, and we would determine that we would have 262 pounds per cubic yard of lightweight aggregate in our mixture. Very, very similar to what we've seen in, this, in these previous calculations. All right, But the basic idea is the same. We're going to determine the volume of chemical shrinkage, and we're going to find a volume of water to hide inside of the lightweight aggregate that equals that volume of chemical shrinkage. Now, if we want to make this more complicated, we can add in additional features and additional functions to this calculation, where, as I've mentioned, we could consider things other than just the volume of chemical shrinkage. We could think about evaporation, or we could think about other things that are taking place in the system. We could add in other features, um, for example, determining the exact chemical shrinkage of the different constituents and put in a weighted average for the chemical shrinkage. We could add in time-dependent properties. We could add in the fact that the aggregate may not completely release all the water as the aggregate starts to desorb. So what I want to do is I'm not going to belabor a lot of these points because I think the most important part of mixture proportioning is really what we've seen, but I want to mention a few things as we look at this. One of the important components of this is sort of the time-dependent um, saturation. So if you wanted to uh, wet your aggregates for a different amount of time, there's a modification of the equation that's shown here at the bottom where we have the time raised to an exponent. That exponent would describe how long the aggregates have been underwater. So you could essentially internally cure your concretes going all the way from oven dry aggregates all the way up to aggregates that have been sitting for a much, much longer period of time. You'll also notice that there's a desorption term that's been added. Now this desorption term uh, is this psi term that we see in this equation, and that simply describes how much water is going to come back out of the lightweight aggregate. Now in general, most materials that are used for internal curing have greater than 85% of the moisture that's given up according to ASTM 1761. So so this psi term frequently is ignored because it's such a high proportion of the water that's going to come back out of the aggregate. However, you could include that in the equations if you wanted to. So here again, I'm just going to give you a simple example of how this could be updated and how this could be used, and I believe that you'll have access to this spreadsheet. The whole idea is you would start out with your conventional concrete mixture and you would enter the values for your conventional concrete mixture shown here in orange. These values are values that you could get from your concrete batch tickets or you could get from your, uh, your local producer to have a concrete mixture that's very similar to uh, what people would be using in practice when you internally cure that concrete mixture. So here we can see that you need to have information about the target air content. You'd need to know the specific gravity of the different materials that you're using. You'd also need to know the mass of the different uh, cement, supplementary materials, uh, fine and coarse aggregate, as well as water that you're adding to the system. Uh, you'll notice here that water to cement ratio is not an input because it's going to be calculated directly from the masses that you input into the, uh, into the spreadsheet. Once you've input this information, you can recall that we're going to start to use the main equation that we've been talking about, which is going to be the mass of the lightweight aggregate being equal to the, de the demand portion of the term, which is the cement factor times the chemical shrinkage times the maximum degree of hydration, divided by the absorption or porosity of our aggregate times the psi, which is this desorption term, times that S value, which is our saturation term that we've been discussing. So as we've entered this into our spreadsheet, we're going to notice that our cement factor is simply going to be the sum of the mass of our cement and our supplementary materials. We're going to make that as an estimate. Our chemical shrinkage, we're going to assume to be 0.07 for the majority of calculations. And as I mentioned before, alpha max is going to be assumed to be a value of 1, except for water to cement ratios less than 0.36. And in the spreadsheet, it will automatically calculate the fractional value because we can't hydrate all of the cement because of a space limitation inside of the paste. S is also going to generally be assumed to 1, and we're going to ignore it in this equation as we, as we work through the spreadsheet. 
Finally, the other two values that we'll look at when we, when we do these calculations in our spreadsheet are going to be seen as three sort of lime green cells inside of the spreadsheet. The lightweight aggregate absorption factor, the lightweight aggregate desorption factor, and the specific gravity of our lightweight aggregate. Now, the important part about the specific gravity is that needs to be determined at a moisture content uh, of where you want to be batching your concrete. So if you're doing this on oven dry, you use a specific gravity of an oven dry aggregate. Here we're going to use a 24-hour absorption uh, value for our, our specific gravity. The absorption is 20%. The desorption is 85%, and we could simply place those in the equation. And once we've placed these into the spreadsheet, now the spreadsheet is going to go through and it's going to do all these calculations automatically for us. So just like we saw before, we're going to calculate out the mass of the lightweight aggregate uh, in an oven-dried state. We're going to have 480 pounds of cement plus 120 pounds of slag. 0 0.07 is our chemical shrinkage term, 20% being our absorption, 85% being our desorption term, and we would determine that we would need uh, 247 pounds of lightweight aggregate in the oven-dried state. To convert that over to the SSD state, we're simply going to uh, do a calculation to take the mass of the, the lightweight aggregate in the oven-dried state, multiply that by 1 times the uh, absorption, and we'll get 296 pounds of of lightweight aggregate in the SSD state. Once we've determined that, we can calculate the volume of the lightweight aggregate in the SSD state, where we're going to go through and we're going to take our 296 pounds, divide through by the specific gravity and the unit weight of water, and come up with 2.6 cubic feet of lightweight aggregate. We're going to then remove that from the sand and we're going to determine the mass of sand that's inside of the mixture as well as the mass of the lightweight aggregate in the mixture. And the nice part about this is this is all done in the spreadsheet and as we saw earlier this approach is very direct we don't change the cementitious material, we don't change the water, we don't change the coarse aggregate, we don't change the air. Really what we've done here is we've changed from using 1,458 pounds per cubic yard of sand down to 1,005 pounds per cubic yard, and we've added in 296 pounds of pre-wetted lightweight aggregate. As I mentioned before, this can be done very simply in the spreadsheet. The whole idea here is that we would take and put orange put the values in the orange cell from our mixture proportions or our mixture design. We would add in the lightweight aggregate that we were talking about earlier, the properties of that in these lime green uh, cells. And finally what we're going to determine is we're going to be able to get the mixture proportions for our internally cured uh, concrete. And here are the mixture proportions that you would use. All of the calculations that we've dis discussed are automated in this spreadsheet and can be done for you directly so that you now have mixture proportions that you can begin uh, batching your concrete with. So the final, the final point that we want to start to describe here is what are the properties of the aggregate that we need to be able to measure so that we could put those into those lime green cells and we could actually know how we we're going to do these measurements and get the properties of our lightweight aggregate. Now it's important that we understand a little bit about lightweight aggregate and what I want to mention here is lightweight aggregate has been around for a long time. The lightweight aggregates that we're using are not something that was developed specifically for internal curing, although they work very well for internal curing, but they've been used for nearly a hundred years commercially in the U.S. and they've been used in concept for many, many more years uh, than that. The basic idea here is the way that these lightweight aggregates are manufactured, they happen, to be ex they happen to be shales, clays, or slates that are going to be expanded, and they're going to be expanded by bloating them, heating them, and trapping gases inside of these materials as they expand. So the materials are going to be mined, they're going to be crushed, they're going to be placed through a rotary kiln, and as they heat, Gases are going to be trapped inside of those materials. They're going to kind of puff up and capture these gases inside of the materials. Those gases that are captured in the material as it's molten will all of a sudden be left behind as pore space or porosity inside of those materials. And it's very important that the pores inside of those materials have specific characteristics that will make these concretes, uh, make these aggregates be able to use, be used in concretes that internally cure. The specific factor that's really, really important about this 
is the size of the pores that are going to form. So we need to have a volume of pores that form in this bloating process, but it's also the size of the pores that become very important because the pores have to be larger in the lightweight aggregate than they are inside of the paste. And by being larger in the lightweight aggregate, this means water will preferentially move from the lightweight aggregate to the paste to provide the internal curing as it's needed. So again, the bloating properties of this depend heavily on the composition. Gases are being trapped inside the material as it's heated, but the secret is really the pores that are left behind happen to be the right size, all right, to be used for internal curing. So what we need to do is we need to, one, be able to check that, and we're going to use our desorption check as a way to measure that. We're also going to need to determine the volume of pores that are in our lightweight aggregate because this is going to help us to determine how much water we're able to hide for internal curing. So again, just to show you what some of these pores look like, here you can see some x-ray tomography images where you can see the different sizes of pores. Now not all the pores inside of the lightweight aggregate are going to be able to contribute to holding water or giving that water back because some are disconnected from the surface, but these pores come in various sizes and various connectednesses. We need to understand what some of those sizes are and we'll have a couple tests that we can look at uh, to get to that information. Now, the particle size and shape are going to be very similar to other aspects of concrete proportioning. They're going to have an impact on workability. However, we're not going to spend a lot of time focusing on particle size and shape because that's covered in other aspects of concrete technology. What we really want to focus in on here is the absorption capacity and some other properties of the aggregate. So really the porosity and how much water those aggregates can hold onto and how much those aggregates can give that water back after we're done with some of this testing. So now there's a wide range of materials across North America. We're gonna look at several of these and we're gonna use several different tests. Gradation obviously gonna be very important because this is gonna impact spacing and paste contents. Uh, as I've mentioned before, we're not going to spend a lot of time on gradation because that's something that's uh, dealt with elsewhere in concrete technology, and there's nothing unique about the lightweight aggregates when it comes to gradation. Similarly, with specific gravity, we need to know this information for mixture proportioning, but what we're going to focus in on is the absorption, how much water can our lightweight aggregates hold, now, there will be several different ways that you could do these tests. Some people recommend doing these tests for three days. We tend to like to use 24 hours of absorption. And what we're going to use is we're going to introduce two different uh, testing procedures to help you get to your pre-wetted surface dry state. One is going to be um, known as the paper towel method. One is going to actually be known as the centrifuge method, and we'll discuss that in a few seconds. Desorption, how much water will be given back to the mixture, and we'll show you some tests that can be done uh, to determine that value. So as I mentioned before, with grading and specific gravity, this is very, very similar to things that you would do for your other sands in your mixture, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. It is important to know, though, that the grading will influence the workability. Right? In general, internally cured concrete can be made with a wide range of fine lightweight aggregate gradations. It's going to be very similar to what we do with our, our typical sands. And what we're going to mention here is when you measure your specific gravity, you need to be very, very consistent on which moisture state you're determining that specific gravity for so you're determining the correct specific gravity factor. However, determining the absorption as a function of time is something that's very unique to the lightweight aggregate because it's going to be a much higher value than we see in our conventional sands. So what we had done here is we've looked at most of the commercial lightweight aggregates throughout the U.S. The idea here is that the absorption test was developed here to measure the absorption as a function of time. These were measured over 48 hours, but you can get a general trend as you start to look at these. And what we're seeing here is the 15 different lightweight aggregates that are being looked at, one from Europe, 14 from North America, and you can look at the absorption that's taking place inside of the samples as a function of time. So the main thing that you will notice here is that the magnitude of absorption is going to depend primarily on the, the source that's being used to make the lightweight aggregate. Clays, shale, slates, they're coming from different locations. 
each one is going to have a slightly different absorption value. And here you can see a wide range of absorptions from about 6% at 24 hours up to a value of about 30%. All of these lightweight aggregates could be used to internally cure your concrete. The other things that you should notice in looking at this graph is you will see that the majority of the absorption occurs very, very rapidly and is going to occur during the first hour. In fact, about 70% of the absorption occurs during the first five minutes. The absorption then will continue slowly over time and will continue after 24 hours, after 48 hours, after 72 hours. We will continue to absorb moisture into the lightweight aggregate. The interesting part though is if you normalize the absorption by the porosity, you'll see that these aggregates all sort of collapse onto a very, very similar curve. So the interesting part about this is all of a sudden now we can start to see that the absorption values, even though they have very different overall absorption values, the absorption rate can be very similar with these different types of aggregates. And this kind of makes sense because these aggregates are all bloated in a very similar way. They end up having a very similar pore size distribution, so they all have a very similar rate of water absorption as we can see in this graph. Now, how do we get these aggregates to a point where they're surface dry? There are several different ways that this could be done. You could use the cone method, the typical ASTM method. However, that method is maybe not as accurate for lightweight aggregate because of the angularity of the aggregate. Here, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about two methods that are commonly used. One that's described in ASTM 1761 uh, currently, where the lightweight aggregate is going to be dried, cooled, and then soaked in water for 72 hours. The excess water can be removed, and then the aggregates are going to be essentially placed uh, under an air current, and you're going to use a paper towel to pat the surface of the aggregate until you get to a point where water and aggregates are not sticking on the towel. Once the aggregate surface is dry and it's not leaving water on the paper towel, you've reached a, satur a pre-wetted surface dry condition, and now you can essentially assume that there's water inside of the pores, but not water on the surface of the aggregate, and you can use these properties for the rest of your mixture proportioning. An alternative to this test is the centrifuge test. So in this particular test, you could place your wetted aggregates into the centrifuge. You can spin the aggregates uh, at a certain speed. We typically use 2,000 RPM for the size that's shown in the picture uh, for about three minutes. The mass of the aggregate is spun. The excess water leaves the centrifuge. And this shows a very good correlation with the paper towel tests. So we are, are very similar in our, our pre-wetted surface dry condition. However, what we've also found is this method tends to be faster, less subjective, and can be a pretty good measure of the overall surface moisture test. So to provide a little bit of confirmation here, what you can notice is at the bottom here, we'll see that the centrifuge test compared to the paper towel test is going to be faster. We also notice that the coefficient of variation is much lower on the centrifuge test than it is for the paper towel test when we have different users. Now that gives us how much the absorption of our aggregates is going to be, because once we know that that amount of water that's inside of those aggregates, we can determine the absorption. What we also want to do is we want to determine the desorption or how much water can be given back by these aggregates. Now there are several different ways to do this. I'm showing a piece of equipment here where you can essentially um, hold the humidity at a constant value, measure the mass change as the sample gets to that point, decrease the humidity, measure the mass change, decrease the humidity, and measure the mass change with the idea that the higher humidity corresponds to larger pores, and we can relate the size of the pores that are emptying out to the relative humidity. Now, the important part of this is if we take this information from our lightweight aggregate and we plot the moisture content that's remaining in the aggregate versus relative humidity, we can see two different types of desorption behavior shown in this image. So at 100% uh, uh, relative humidity, we have that absorption value that we calculated from either the centrifuge or using the paper towel method and determining how much water had been absorbed by the aggregate. However, what we see in the desorption test is 
we're measuring what the difference is from that absorption line to the actual blue or red line respectively and that's going to be our desorption value that's how much water is given back to the paste out of the aggregate the blue response is much more desirable in terms of internal curing than the red response the blue response says that at high relative humidities the majority 85 95 percent of the water is going to come back out of the lightweight aggregate and supply curing water to the paste. The red line shows, a, uh, shows an aggregate that may have less desirable properties where you're only getting maybe 60% of the moisture coming out of the aggregate able to internally cure the paste. Will both work for internal curing? Yes, but you're going to need much more of the red aggregate. The interesting thing to take away though is for all of the expanded shale slates and clays throughout North America, they all have a psi value, a desorption value that's over 85% and comply with ASTM 1761. And this is a test that can be also done very simply um, on a production scale where they can actually evaluate this by simply taking a uh, wetted aggregate, placing it over a known salt that has a humidity of 94%, and measuring this mass change and ensuring that the desorption is over 85%. So again, just to back this up, the commercial materials that we're talking about as expanded shales, clays, and slates will have over 85% of their moisture being released at high relative humidities. This means that that water is available for internal curing. Said another way, it means that the size of the pores in the lightweight aggregate is slightly bigger than the size of the pores in the paste and water will move from the lightweight aggregate to provide the internal curing that the paste needs. So you can go through and can calculate that desorption value. There are other technologies that you could use if you wanted to measure higher than 98 percent relative humidity. Here you can see a porous pressure plate. Um, this will give you the values from 99.9 .9 percent humidity on down to 94 percent humidity. Um, but in summary, what I want to mention here are some of the main points of what we've covered during this module. First, internal curing is nothing more than doing the same thing that we've known to do to concrete, supply moisture to help the hydration reaction. The only difference is instead of doing this on the surface or external to our concrete, we're doing this inside of our concrete. Internal curing is going to use porous inclusions, lightweight aggregate to supply that internal curing water. The aggregate needs to be well spaced and when you're using a fine lightweight aggregate this will provide good spacing and will essentially ensure that you will get water moving to all parts of the paste inside of the mixture and getting the mixture uh, internally cured throughout the entire cross section. The important lightweight aggregate properties are going to be grading and specific gravity. They're also going to be this property of absorption and desorption. Now the absorption we all are relatively familiar with. This is how much water can be absorbed or sucked up by our, our aggregate. And We have several tests to uh, help to get to a, a surface dry condition. One being the paper towel test. One being the centrifuge test. Desorption you can think of as sort of a newer property. Uh, this is how much water is given back from the aggregate to the paste. This can be measured fairly easily with a known salt and just by measuring this on an aggregate that's been taken to a pre-wetted condition. Once we know the properties of our aggregate, once we know our absorption, once we know our desorption, proportioning the light internal curing materials is very, very straightforward. We are going to figure out what's the demand that we have for the system. This is driven by the volume of chemical shrinkage. We're going to figure out how much supply uh, can be provided, how much water can be supplied, and this is going to determine how much lightweight aggregate that we use. So in general, we're going to use about seven pounds of water for every hundred pounds of cement, and we've shown different ways that this could be calculated so that you could use this in your mixture proportioning. There are several different um, references that are shown here. If you have questions on any of these methods, we'd be more than happy to take an email. Um, we hope that you found the second module useful. 
and we hope that you'll be able to use it to internally cure concretes. And we look forward to you, to you joining us for the third module, which will focus in on shrinkage and how to reduce shrinkage with internal curing. The fourth module, which will talk about mechanical and durability properties. And the fifth module, which will discuss the role of internal curing uh, with, in, with respect to um, sustainability. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to send an email. Um, and we wish you success in using internal curing on your projects.